that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice, the Lord has come into your presence. You are the beloved ones of God. Know that God walks with you through this parade and time of celebration and in all the times ahead. Amen. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He comes with joy and hope. Hosanna. Blessed is Jesus Christ who comes in God's name. God, you're awesome. With great joy, we welcome you. We welcome you, Lord Jesus. The journey has been long. We have longed to enter the holy city. You come into our hearts and our lives. Humbly, patiently, encouraging us to learn and grow. To embark on journeys of hope and healing. So open our hearts, O oh good God, to hear your word today as we sing praise to you. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Oh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Let us worship God in music.
If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In preparation for the spoken word of the United Choir. Their representatives will once again lead us in a song.
Praise God. We are going to reflect on one of the lessons on the lectionary for today, Palm Sunday. Philippians 2, 1 through 14. And we are going to reflect on this passage to handle the topic, Attitude is the Strongest Argument. Attitude is the strongest argument. And we will use as our main our focus point for the text, verses 3 and 4 in particular, which read, which read as follows, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let us pray. Speak, O oh God, your word to us. Speak a word that would bless our hearts. Speak a word that would be relevant to our lives. So let the purpose and the presence and the power of the risen Christ be manifested in this a time of reflection in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The people in the church at Philippi understood something about argument. You see, the people in the church at Philippi were very status conscious people. Indeed, the entire society was very status conscious. People, you know, it was what you will call um, a shade-based society. You were, you were people of status. You enjoyed, of course, privilege and power. And of course, you were people without status then. Basically, shame was your lot. So everybody in the community of Philippi understood something about argument. What do I mean? Everybody who was anybody did their best to present an argument about their status and their station in life. Why do you think Paul wrote these words found in Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4? Let's read them again. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Well, Paul wrote them because there were issues in the church. Paul wrote these words because people were, were having problems relating with one another. People were having problems with their attitude. People, as I said, were very self-conscious. So precisely for those reasons, Paul wrote those words. People were not hesitant in their attitude to present the argument to one another in the church that I'm better off than you, and, and don't you ever forget it. That my status is different and higher than yours, and don't you forget it. The attitude was true in the church as it was true in the society. The honor-based, shame-based culture into which Paul was writing. So they had issues with their attitude. They didn't always get it right. They didn't always manage to live in harmony. There were those insisting on the fulfillment of personal ambitions above the purpose of God and above the good of the community. And so Paul was writing to them to encourage them to put aside their discord, to put aside their selfish desires for prominence and prestige, and to replace those desires with a selfless desire to serve God and to love one another. And to make his point about how different their attitude should be to the rest of the community, Paul presented them with a picture of God that 
they would have found to be downright alarming, if not revolting. And this picture of God that Paul presented them with, we can read it in Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 8. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross. Some say that these are actually the words of a hymn, but whether they are original to Paul or they are words of a hymn, Paul used them to address a situation in the church at Philippi. Picture this. God took on the form of a slave. Have you seen slaves arguing with their masters? This Jesus, who is God from the beginning, Paul acknowledged that. John acknowledged that. This Jesus, who is God from the beginning, took on the attitude of a slave. Attitude took on the form of a slave and went to the point of crucifixion. Now, crucifixion was the death reserved for the worst, the worst of criminals and slaves. And crucifixion was, was designed so to eliminate someone that, that usually the body was, was thrown in, in ditches and eaten by wild animals of the crucified victim. And our God took on the form of a slave so that he would endure that kind of death. Though as we know the story, Jesus actually was buried in a tomb. When Paul presents this picture to make a point, and in fact, in reflecting on the point Paul is making, several things can be said about the right attitude of Christ that Paul presents. Let us observe two. And the first one, I will put it in these words. It is an attitude that does not look for an argument. Paul is encouraging in his hearers an attitude that does not look for an argument and is presenting in the picture of God that he uses as illustration. Just read in verses 5 to 8. This, it is an attitude that does not look for an argument. Let's look at it. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being formed in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Well, Can you imagine anybody giving up their, 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 their very noble status in this culture, much less agreeing to take on the form of a slave, and you are saying, God did that? That was not only alarming, but it was revolting. But that is precisely what Paul was saying. Status is not what God is all about. God is about humility. And God is about service. 
And godliness is about humility. And godliness is about service. And Paul wanted to drive home that point to this honor-based, shame-based culture in which status meant so much. Let's use a modern day illustration. We have probably heard of the name Joshua Bell, who is a world-renowned violinist. Well, Joshua Bell was once approached by a 12-year-old who said to him, Wow, you are famous. And of course, at least pretending to be modest, he said, mm, Not really. But the kid insisted, Oh yes, your name is on every video game in the arcade as the high scorer. You see, Joshua had pretty much been an overachiever, whether it was chess or computers or video games or violin. He had pretty much mastered the art of being at the top. So the young man said, yes, of course you're famous. And why are we talking all that? To say this, greatness is measured in different ways by different people. And greatness was certainly measured in a certain way in the culture Paul was writing to. The honor, shame-based culture of the Philippian church. But Paul is saying that in the kingdom of heaven, there is also a standard of greatness. And that standard of greatness is humility and servanthood. Those are God's standards of greatness. And therefore, he presents this picture of Jesus Christ, this picture of God. Jesus, who is God from the beginning, he presents this picture and saying, listen, this is the attitude we must have. And I'm putting it in these words. It is an attitude that does not look for an argument. We make a mistake if we think that the standards of greatness that are popular with us are the same standards of greatness with God. Or are the same standards that God uses. My thoughts are not your thoughts, said the Lord. Nor are my ways your ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And my ways higher than your ways. God's standard of greatness does not look for an argument. And on this Palm Sunday, Jesus demonstrated that attitude by riding into Jerusalem. Not on a horse, the mount of war, but on a donkey, the mount of peace. Not on a horse, the symbol of pride and strength and arrogance, but on a humble donkey, the symbol of humility. God's standard of greatness are found in humility and in servanthood. So we can observe this truth that I put in these words. This attitude that Paul is encouraging in the Philippian church that must be different from the wider society, the honor-based, shame-based culture of the day is this. Have this attitude that Jesus had. And we are observing that it is an attitude that does not look for an argument. Picture the slave arguing with the master. But secondly, let's make this point. It is an attitude that always wins the argument. No, that's a paradox. We are saying in the first instance it doesn't look for an argument. And now you are saying 
It is the attitude that always wins the argument. Well, how does Paul illustrate that in the text? Look at verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He didn't present an argument, and yet he wins the argument. And he's saying you must have this attitude. The attitude that doesn't present an argument about status. But the attitude which in the end, God will ensure that you win the argument. He does not look for an argument, and yet it always wins the argument. The point is this. All other names under heaven or those already in heaven or elsewhere will bow to Christ. That's what those verses just said. Whether they be senators or whether they be generals or whether they be emperors or whether they be kings or queens or dictators, those words will never bear somehow. They will bow to Christ. Whatever their names, or whatever their ranks, because Jesus Christ has been given the name that is above all names. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven or on earth or on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is an attitude that always wins the argument. Well, how do we apply that in our everyday life? In many aspects, but let me use an illustration that perhaps you might identify with. In 1984, 1988, and 1992, American speed skater Dan Johnson suffered a series of disappointments in his attempt to win Olympic gold. How did he keep coming back time and time again? He says he learned to keep things in perspective. In the book Full Circle, Johnson writes, well, he writes about his experience that helped him to keep things in perspective and helped him to become the champion athlete that he went on to become in his adult life. And he writes, and I quote, when I was nine years old, I was competing at the Youth National Championship in Minnesota. I was in good position to win my first national title when coming around the turn, I tripped on a rubber hose that they set up as a lane marker and that slip cost me the title by one point. He writes, I started crying. I was crying as mom took off my skates. And I was crying during the award ceremonies. He says, I was still crying when we got into the car. And when we pulled into the driveway six hours later, the picnic is still crying. <laughs> said, my father hadn't spoken a word to me all the way home. But as we got out of the car, he said quietly to me some words that changed his perspective. Some words that helped him to widen his perspective, that helped him to be the champion athlete he eventually became. This is what his father said to him. He said, you know, Dan, 
There's more to life than skating around in circles. There's more to life than skating around in circles. Well, what do we learn from that? As bitter as any loss that we may have suffered may be, when we know the Lord, we have to remember that there's always more to life than any disappointment we are now facing. And so we need to widen our perspective. And if we are able to widen our perspective, we will actually find the right attitude that will help us be the life champions that God really wants us to be. Paul was able to widen his perspective. And his perspective became so wide that he said some words that perhaps would have been equally alarming to people in that culture. You know what he said? All things work together for good for them that love God. And so when you're going through your deepest pain and your deepest disappointment, you have to develop the spiritual practice of asking God to widen your perspective. Because God has a way of shutting doors that he doesn't want his people to go through. And so when a door slams in your face, or a relationship shut down on you, don't be cursing all around you, including your stars on which you were born under. But you have to ask, what is this good God saving me from? What deliverance is occurring right now that I don't even know? Because my perspective is not that wide. Because he looks from above and he can see the whole picture. And I have my own myopic vision. And if you get a hold of that, you wouldn't be like that nine year old picnic that cried for hours. Over some of the painful stuff we have to go through. But we would have our vision widened by Paul and be able to say, All things work together for good for them that love God. And that is true. Whether today you have all the money in the world, or whether today your bank account empty, God is going to take care of you. And God is able to help you get through what you're going through if you're able to find the right attitude. And so, Whatever you're going through today, ask God to help you get through it with the right attitude. Ask God to help you with the attitude that will make you the champion. God really wants you to be. Because God has blessed us here. Our problem is not ability. God has blessed us with ability. Our problem is not talent. God has blessed us with talent. Our problem is not intelligence. God has blessed us with intelligence. But often we are not where God wants us to because our problem is attitude. And this was the problem with the Philippian church. They are people of status, intelligence, ability. But the church having problems because people have the wrong attitude. And so, he wrote these words to them in Philippians chapter 2 that we just read. 
about having the mind that was in Christ Jesus. And from what Paul wrote to them, I have extrapolated these two main points. I'm not even making three today, just two. Have this attitude. It is an attitude that does not look for an argument. And it is an attitude that always wins the argument. Because when we trust God, the right attitude, no matter our experience, we're going to know that all things work together for good. And so if in the Christian faith, you are going to do something that is going to show how good you are, don't do it. Put those verses up again, verses 3 and 4. Philippians 2, 4, 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. If you get nothing out of this text, get this. If you are going to do something that is going to show how great you are, don't do it. But if you're going to do something that will show how good God is, yes. do it with all your might. But do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility regard others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Well, that was revolutionary in the honor based, shame based culture that he was writing into. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Let your attitude first show your love for God and your love for one another. It is the attitude that does not look for an argument, but by the grace of God. The attitude that always wins the argument. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us just bow our heads in prayer before we call on the United Choir to sing again. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God, in this moment, we surrender ourselves to you. Because it is in surrender to you. That we find the right attitude to live by. So we surrender our spirits to you today. Imperfect people we are. Sinners that we are. And we ask for your cleansing. We ask for your grace. We surrender ourselves to you. Because you know us best. And you are able to minister to us. In ways that would help us do our best ministry. So take charge of us. We surrender our lives to you today afresh. Cleanse us and renew us. Take charge of us. We are bold enough to say, oh God, we are yours. And we are willing to make you ours. So God, cleanse our sins. Put us on the path that you want us to be on. Bring you the greatest glory. We lift up before you those who are suffering. We lift up before you those who are sick. We are praying for your healing. And we are praying for your deliverance. For them in their various estates of sickness. As we pray for us. In our various estates of need. In Jesus name. Amen. We worship God himself.